Good morning. How's the greatest church on the planet doing today? You survived the storm of 2024 the other night. Man, we had a, it was blowing sideways. I said, Lord, we just got to have some church on Sunday. Everything's going to be okay. I want to say a big welcome home to all of those that are joining us uh, for the first or second time. Uh, those that are joining us online as well. We are thrilled that you are here. You're here on a very, very special, special Sunday. We have a dear friend of ours. Uh, one of our overseers is in the house. I'm going to tell you more about that in just a bit. Um, tonight, uh, not tonight, excuse me, uh, this week, I'll tell you more about this at the end of our time today, but we're going to start, our church was really founded with prayer. We didn't have much of anything. We just had Jesus. Come on, somebody. Like we, <laughs> it's like we were telling, Sandra and I were talking to our kids. They're like, what did you have when you started out? We said a lot of love, and that was it, right? No furniture, no money to buy furniture, just a whole lot of love, right? And when we started the church, when we planted the church, we didn't have much, but we had we had a connection with God. We just cried out to God. We had prayer and intercession and fasting. And I, I here's the danger. As, as things go well and as things grow, you kind of lean on your own understanding and your own ability. And you say, whoa, 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 I remember how this started. We will finish the way we started. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to carve out a week of prayer. And if you've never seen corporate prayer, um, uh, like people coming together in, in by the dozens, walking around or sitting down and, and just praying. And you've never seen that before. Every single night this week, we're going to be hungering, uh, hungry and thirsting for, for righteousness, for God to move across our, uh, across our nation, across our city, in our homes, in our schools. It's going to be a powerful, powerful time. If you've never seen that, I want to invite you to be here every single night from 7 p.m., to 8 p.m. Well, Pastor, I've, I've got kids. Yeah, I know. And you keep those kids out in the ballpark till 10 p.m. Come on, somebody. I see you wandering around Walmart at 9.30 with those kids. Bring those kids in the pajamas. Let them see mom and dad cry out to God. Watch God do something. All right. Well, without further ado, I, I want to introduce to you, uh, our church is, is led by elders. We, we are pastor-led, right? We have elders and pastors. We have trustees that or use their wisdom and, and ability in the business realm to help uh, the, the church with their finances and vision and how to guide that. And then we have pastors of respected congregations around the country. Um, there's not many. We have, we have a handful, just a few, of godly men. And I want you to hear my heart today. Uh, I've known Pastor Chad since we were teenagers and I've watched God absolutely, his favor is just not fair on their life. When your church has a splash pad for your kid's church, you're doing something right, ladies and gentlemen. But what I love is before they did the auditorium, that they, this beautiful auditorium they have now, you know what they did? They built a, a great auditorium for kids. Before they expanded their auditorium because they're growing in other campus, you know what they did? They did an outside venue for their kids the heart that I have and carry for the next generation, you're going to hear that with Pastor Chad. It absolutely is reaching multiple campuses on the Alabama Gulf Coast. Come on, somebody. Can we put our hands together for one of our overseers and a friend of Highland Church for Pastor Chad Stafford, everybody. Come on. Thank you. I love you, too. Put yourself out you are so kind. Thank you so much. I don't know if you guys knew this, but uh, whenever I met Pastor Hal, I was about 12 years old. He had hair like Rapunzel. I'm telling you, flowing around the back. He was a couple of years older than me and could run like the wind, still has soccer records uh, in our area. And he, did you know he still holds the record for the longest field goal at Baldwin County High School. 46 yards, I was there that night. So you're Mimi and Pop, I've known since I was 12 years old. They are known in our, uh, our house as Uncle Harold and Aunt Janie, all right? Our parents work together. And um, one of the things I wanna just say about your pastor, he has always served God. I remember, I was a rebellious teenager. I didn't get saved till I was 19. And, and I remember thinking, wow, how's different? How doesn't cuss? How I many of y'all know? I mean, I, I was, but before I got saved, I was a good heathen. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? 
I couldn't go like two sentences without saying a cuss word. And I could like turn things into a cuss word. How never did that? How never ran around or drank or anything like that? Whenever I got saved, he was one of the people I was like, you know what? I, it, how can do it? Your, your pastor has always been a man of integrity. He's one of these guys that but for years, he served Jesus when serving Jesus wasn't cool. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? And he, whenever he met his wife, he met, they became a power couple. And I thank God for godly women who are kind, who have a call of God on their life, who said, you know what? Uh, uh, she's so similar to my wife where they're like, we can do anything because we're called to do it. And so, yeah, there, there hadn't been a role that Sandra hadn't had in this church. There hadn't been a role that Jennifer hadn't had in our church. The first ever nursery director, you know, whatever we do, we do it because we're called. And so I just wanna let you know, it's an honor to serve as an overseer at your church. We are huge fans. When Pastor Hal comes and uh, preaches for me, our people love it. They just said, you know what? I just feel so refreshed when Pastor Hal and Sandra come and uh, Shayla always goes to camp with us. And so uh, we've recruited her uh, to, to be a future staff member. Y'all can't have her. We've already uh, laid claim to her. And then let me let you know something. We're going after Mia quick because that sister can preach. I looked at her this morning and I'm still, I watched her, uh, her message on Ruth and I said, Mia, the redeemed made way for the, for the redeemer. Pure poetry, my sister. Hey, guys, it's a thrill to be here with you. Thank you for, uh, for, for having me today. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Old Testament book of Zechariah, chapter four. And if you are new to uh, church or examining Christianity, we are so glad to have you. And in just a few moments from now, we are going to be giving you an opportunity to begin a relationship with Jesus. Uh, we have some books in the lobby that I wrote several years ago. It's called 40 Days with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, those of us right now, we're about to go into a, a series of, of prayer and fasting. I wrote this uh, years ago because I have a, 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 about 80% of our congregation uh, there on the Gulf Coast, they are new converts. And so they were like, what is this like Holy Spirit thing that you're talking about? Some of them heard the Holy Ghost before and they're like, so you're, that's kind of freaking me out. So I wrote this book as a response uh, to that. Uh, they sell online for $15 each, but you guys are family, so we just do a donation basis with you. Now, understand something. There's another church that I'm on, on staff, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an overseer for. Whenever I say that's donation basis only, they heard free, okay? And so the guy came up to me after, the pastor goes, oh, we had four services to preach. He goes, Chad, you're already out of books. And I was like, hallelujah, look at God moving. And they were like, oh, well, we thought they were free. And I was like, okay, maybe explain this a little bit. Let me let you know something. Uh, Highlands uh, Church, uh, I'm on your board of directors. If you're here today and you want a book and you ain't got no money, let it be our gift to you, all right? I love you guys. I wanna see more people filled with the Holy Spirit and develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. So it's an honor to serve you. The other day, uh, my accountant and I were talking. He goes, Chad, this is awesome. You've sold about 800 books. And I was like, okay, that's not so bad. And he goes, the only problem is you've given away over 2,000. I don't write books to make money. I write books because it helps me to uh, make sense out of the world. I just wanna let you know, if you buy a book today, it helps to go and feed a hungry child. That child's name is Evan Stafford. He's my son. He's 16 years old. <laughs> so, so anyway, hey, uh, let's pray and we'll get started. Father, I love you so much. Thank you again for um, another opportunity I have to share your word with people I just love and respect so much. And over these next few moments, I ask you to hide me behind your cross so that you can be lifted up, draw all people to yourself. Now, Holy Spirit, we make this weekly declaration. We've done everything we know to do. We have prayed, we have fasted, we have studied, and we have sought you for your word. We've loaded up all the songs on the screen, and Lord, all the media is ready to go. Now, Holy Spirit, we ask you to do what only you can do, which is transform people's lives forever and for all the fruit this morning. We'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. How many of you folks are psyched to know that college football is about to start again? Come on. You know, uh, by the way, I was sitting there thinking, you know, we got another way. But no, Georgia Tech plays next Saturday. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> so... I'm assuming this is a dog congregation, right? <laughs> no engineers in the house is what you're telling me. All right, uh, but no, it actually begins uh, next weekend. 
And so um, I had one guy told me, uh, he was almost in tears a couple of years ago because we all kind of like, people don't understand it up north where we kind of get this crazy look in our eye around August because I have to repent because I look forward to the college football season more than I do Christmas. You know, yeah, probably not supposed to as a Christian, but you know, I'm just sitting over there like, I'm already planning out my menu. And one guy was talking to me uh, like the week before uh, the college football and he looked at me and goes, I am so excited, PC. My Saturdays are about to have meaning again. <laughs> I said, you probably don't wanna tell your wife that. <laughs> and so, and so uh, I, as in preparation for this, I wanna show you a famous clip that I saw uh, uh, the, uh, maybe we have a couple of Alabama fans in the house, I don't know, but I was looking for a, a clip that kind of gave this point. There's this, there's this uh, post a couple of years ago. This was the opening game where it was USC versus Alabama. And this is how the USC Mighty Mighty Trojans came out. They were all jacked up and they were all psyched up and man, Snoop Dogg got online and he's talking all kind of smack. He said, we coming for you, Alabama. And then later on, they got the worst tail whooping that they had had in 50 years. They lost 52 to six. I heard the one of the lone roll tide there. And here's what, uh, why are you talking about this, PC? Because here goes the greatest illustration that some of us need to understand. Everybody wants to win on game day. How many of you know there's a difference between wanting to win and knowing how to win? These guys didn't know how to win just yet. And the same thing happens with our spiritual lives. Most followers of Jesus never grow. Do you know why? Because they don't know how to grow. They never walk in favor with God because they think when God tells us to do something, it's always big, but that's not the case. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're taking notes today, I want you to write this down. The biggest things with God always start small. And in fact, Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, how we handle the little things in life is an indicator for how we're gonna handle the big things. I was talking with a millionaire developer who went belly up in... Um, uh, several years ago that went belly up in the recession, never recovered. I was offering him a chance to come be our CFO. I said, I need you. And he had lost everything, but man, he was, he was a developer. He, he was a president of Citizens Bank for years. And he said, I, he goes, let me, let me think about it for a little while because I got this big deal cooking. And he said, and if, if I could get involved in this deal, I just, I know I can, I, I can get, uh, that things would change. And I looked at him, I said, let me just throw it out of there. And I, uh, you're talking, everything that, I, that I'm hearing from you, you're trying to get back in the game with one swing. But that's not how you built your fortune. You built your fortune a little bit at a time, a little bit here. You know, the Bible says uh, that uh, the Proverbs, that the wealthy gather their money little by little. That man kept wanting something big to get back in the game. And he died years later living in somebody else's condo rent free. High school seniors, you're going into this year, you're looking at graduation. Are you believing God for a scholarship for college? Nobody is, okay, I'll believe for you, all right? The question is this, how clean is your room? How clean's your car? When we have clean cars and rooms, we take a step to show God that we can be trusted with more. Well, PC, I clean up my car, but right now I'm just so busy. Honey, how do you think it's gonna be when you get to college? I'm, uh, uh, where, what do you mean? More busy. You're gonna get organized now. Amen, mom and dad? Amen. By the way, mom and dad, are you believing God for more money? <laughs> well, the question is, how's that budget going? All right. God wants to give us more, but he won't until we can manage what we have. I meet so many different people who are like, PC, I need to get a grip on my finances, but budgeting is just so hard. You're right, it is. If budgeting was easy, Congress could do it but they even struggle with it. I remember the first time I ever read about the blessing of the tither, whenever it said, man, I will pour out, uh, I'm gonna pour out so much blessing, you ain't gonna be able to contain it. I remember thinking, Pastor Hal, that I was gonna be like Scrooge McDuck. I was gonna be doing backflips and gold coins. Come on, some of y'all remember the duck tails on how Scrooge McDuck would do all that. And here's what happened. Whenever, what I didn't understand was that God wasn't gonna make me rich. Whenever he says, I'm gonna pour out so much blessing on you, what he's saying is you're gonna, I'm gonna be able to speak to you in a language that very few people understand because you're walking in financial covenant with me. 
When you and I pay our tithes, watch this. God unclogs our ears. I, I've had multiple ear surgeries. I'm gonna gross y'all out a little bit, all right? My ears produce a lot of wax. You don't wanna see my AirPods, all right? You're like, oh my God, did somebody stick a sugar daddy in this thing or something? I produce a lot of wax. And so three times, like four times a year, I gotta go get my ears cleaned out, all right? And so I'll go get my ears cleaned out. And they're like, yep, you were new. I'll get, as soon as I get back to the house, I'm like, dear God, this television's loud. And Jennifer goes, walk in my world. Why? Because my ears are open. Here's what happens. Whenever God says, I'm gonna pour out so much blessing you're gonna be able to have, he's gonna, I'm gonna, I've got things I wanna say to you. And I'm not just gonna bless your finances. I'm gonna talk to you in ways that will produce generational blessing, not just wealth, but I'm gonna talk to you about how to advance and work. I'm gonna talk to you about how to be a problem solver. Come on, God leads us step by step. He fixes us one issue at a time and he leads us one step at a time. You see, some of us would be like, I'm trying to get in shape, and it's just it's just tough. I had I used to work out at the YMCA uh, in our town, and there was an older gentleman there named Mr. Ben. Mr. Ben was an elder in our church, and I would see him working out one day. And he comes up to me. It's in January. He's fired up. He's madder than a wet hen. I said, "What's the matter with you, Mr. Ben?" He goes, I can't stand all these new people being up in here. I can't hardly get on a machine. He's just furious. I looked at him and I said, I've always been a gym rat. I looked at him and I said, Mr. Ben, give it three weeks. I said, come February, you're gonna be able to get on whatever machine you want. I said, I said because this is a New Year commitment thing. And he looked at me and goes, all right, I ain't gonna quit just yet. By February, he's over there. It's an empty place. He looks over there at me like, like just like that, he's as happy as all get up. And so here's the thing, the bad workouts, so those of us who are trying to get in shape, the bad workouts are the most important ones because it's easy to train when you feel good, but it's crucial to show up even when you don't feel like it. And even if you do less than you hope, it's not always about what happens during the workout, it's becoming the type of person that does not miss workouts. Are y'all following me today? If you really wanna break this addiction, some of us would say, PC, you go in there, all right? I'm Chad, I'm your friend, and I love you. Let me ask you this. Are you going to recovery meetings? Are you reading your Bible every day? Are you attending church and in a small group regularly? Can I let you know, I'm, I've been serving God for 31 years, and I've been in full-time ministry since 1998. And over the last 26 years, you know what I've learned that's so sad? Now, of course, I'm not talking to anybody at Highlands Church, okay? Only the finest people in the world go to this church, Okay? I'm talking about your friend's church, okay? Or those that are watching online. No, I'm just kidding. But the one thing I've discovered is most Christians don't want healing, deliverance, or blessings. You know what they want? They just want somebody to cry with them. Think about that. Because they refuse to do the things that actually bring healing, deliverance, and blessings. So if you're facing some challenges today and have some big dreams that, uh, that you want God to fulfill, if you wanna do th big things in life, we need to think small, y'all. And that's the name of our, uh, of our message today, all right? So we need to remember something about God, that God doesn't start with trees, he starts with seeds. Years ago, I was asked to sit on the board of the YMCA in my local place, and I was about to leave. It was getting pretty run down. And they said, they, they said, just sit in one meeting and we want to see if you want to be on our board of directors. So I sat in there and, I, and almost immediately I knew I didn't want to be a part of this board because I wasn't learning anything. They had a set agenda and they said, this is what we want to do. We want to put the C back in the YMCA. We want to be, we want to be known for our Christian values and, and stuff like that. I'm like, all right, uh, you're a gym. So I was sitting there and they're like, yeah, so we wanna, what do you think about us putting a prayer box out there where people can put prayer requests? And they're, what they're, they're essentially trying to do is do the work of a church. And I said, you know what would be the greatest witness that we, that we could probably do if you really wanna put the C back in the YMCA? And they said, what? They're all ears like, oh, Pastor Chad, he's got a fast growing church and we're gonna listen to him. I said, the greatest witness that you could do is to make sure that your machines stop being so broken and so dirty. I said, maybe have your Wi-Fi up to date where people can actually listen to some music that they want to work out by and not your cruddy music. And I'm sitting over there and guess what they decided to do? They decided to put a prayer box out there. Two years later, 50% enrollment down. Enrollment down by 50%. 
Why? Because we don't want to do the small things that actually bring growth. And let me give you a background about what we're going to read, and we're going to go through this pretty quick. At this time in Jew, uh, Jewish history, God is rebuilding Israel. They turned away from God, and they were overtaken by their enemies. They were carried off to Babylon for 70 years. And by the way, during that time, there was a debate. Some false prophets were saying, yeah, don't worry, it's not going to be 70 years. And the, 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 Jeremiah's lying to you. And Jeremiah said, it's going to be all of 70 years. Do you know why? Because for 490 years, they did not let their land rest. They had this deal. Imagine growing up in this. Every seven years, God wanted to give you the year off if you worked in Israel. How many of y'all believe that America needs to go back to that? And he would say, look, let your land rest. Pour into your family. Study the Torah. Let your, this is going to be good for your land. And it's going to be good for you because I'm going to give you so much abundance that you can afford to do this. And guess what? Israel was like, you know what? We're going to stop doing this. And for 490 years, they kept on farming. And guess what happened? Whenever they were finally overtaken by their enemies, God said, guess what? You're going to pay me back for, them seven, uh, for those, uh, those 490 years. So for 70 years, you go. that's why he told Jeremiah to tell him, hey, go ahead and plant you some crops up in here. Build you some homes. Go ahead and marry because you're going to be here for a while. How many of you, what's the principle behind this? Obey God now while it makes sense. Well, Pastor Chad, I don't believe in paying that tithe. You're going to pay your tithe somewhere. Only problem is you may not pay it to Highlands Church, but you are going to pay it to the auto mechanic. Or you're going to pay it to the repairman around your house. God's going to get his. So you might as well be in covenant with God and watch the other stuff last longer. Y'all ain't got to give me an amen for that one. I'll amen myself on that one. So Israel had to pay the price now, and they're beginning to return back home. And a guy named Nehemiah has built back the protective wall. And God tells a man by the name of Zerubbabel to be begin to rebuild the temple that's been in ruin for over 20 years. The temple is now a heaping pile of rubble, which is exactly what God told them it was going to become if they began to worship the building and not him. When God says, hey, look, you want to build me a fancy building? That's cool. That's awesome. I'll put my spirit there. But the day you forsake me, he tells her this, I will put my spirit here. But the day you, I will turn this building into a heaping pile of rubble. And that's exactly what's happened. All right? There's this enormous mountain of debris. And we look over there and we see our properties getting all tore up and everything. Imagine just piles and piles and piles of rubble. Zerubbabel looks at this and God tells him to rebuild this temple. He looks at it and he gets overwhelmed about how big the job is. He begins to think, this job ain't never gonna get done. How in the world is this gonna happen? And God sends an angel to the prophet Zechariah to encourage him about how he's gonna get it done. Look at verse six in Zechariah chapter four, it says this. So he said to me by the word of the Lord, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Now let's break it down because this shows us two ways that, uh, that it's not gonna happen. He says it won't happen by might. What does that mean? Might means collective strength, all right? He said, look, I ain't gonna get a massive group or an army to come over here and help you to move all this stuff out, all right? It's not gonna happen that way. And by the way, get in a group. The reason why, because you, when you get in a group, we can get better faster, we can move forward quicker, and we can get healed up quicker. Who you run with matters. Two things will rob you the most in life, running with the wrong folks and believing the wrong things. Being in a small group helps eliminate that. By the way, did you know that psychologists have noticed that the truth shrinks as the crowd grows? In large meetings, uh, where they notice, uh, in large meetings at work, people would hold back their honest opinion. And when they talk about what offends the fewest people, but it's not the truth, small groups are more likely to find more truth than larger ones. And what God is telling them in this verse, he's saying this, I ain't sending you people uh, by the thousands to help carry this thing off. He said, it's not gonna be by might. He says, it's not gonna be by power. What's power? It's individual strength. Now, I'm one of those guys, I'm an old football coach that God called into ministry. What does that mean? It means I ain't smart enough to confuse you, Okay. And so I have no craftsmanship whatsoever. What, I, like, I brag on myself for changing out the light bulbs. I'm like, hey, Jennifer, did you see it? You see the light bulbs? Yeah, that's all me. You know, that's all I got. But as far as tearing stuff down, I'm your guy. I remember I was working, uh, I couldn't go to lunch. One time I was working out on this pier. 
uh, we live on the water. And, uh, and so I was working out on this pier and there was this boathouse and they were all going there. And so my job was kind of like all the other stuff. And they said, hey, Chad, um, we're going to lunch. And they knew I had to be gone by a certain hour. And I was like, I don't want to, I, I got to go. And I don't want to, I don't want to dock no hour. And so the guy that was, that was running, he goes, hey, when I get home, I want that boathouse down. I was like, got ya. When they came home, let me tell you something. I kept on swinging. They didn't care how it got down. So I was back in those days, I was lifting a bench pressing over 400 pounds. So I just went ahead and I just got my sledgehammer and your boy went to work. And they got home and they're like, I cannot believe this has happened. I had that kind of crazy strength, but I had no craftsmanship whatsoever. They're like, hey, look, how many of y'all know uh, that being broke is a great motivator? So I was like, I, I, I can, all of the rest of the team, these are, they're like hammering and sawing and stuff like that. And they're like, well, what are we gonna do with it? They came back in there and finally I was the man on the job. They're like, man, Chad's got that power. Let, let me let you know something. God's telling him, it ain't gonna happen because of your strength. It's not gonna happen by your cleverness. And then he tells him how it's gonna happen. He goes, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty, or the other version I like that says, by the, uh, it says, by my spirit, the, uh, the Lord Almighty, or the Lord of angel armies. Did you just catch that? God's saying, we about to go to war on this thing. He's telling them, my spirit is gonna give you everything that you're gonna need when you need it to do this. I will send people when you need it and I'll give you strength when you need it and I'll give you the resources when you need it, but I will continually supply you with everything you need. I got you, son. That's how God builds things. And then look how God starts to pump up Zerubbabel and brag on him. Look at verses eight to 10, it says this. So big mountain, who do you think you are? God's smack talking the heap of rubble. So big mountain, who do you think you are? Next is Zerubbabel, you're nothing but a molehill. He'll proceed to set the cornerstone in place accompanied by cheers. Yes, yes, do it. After that, the word of the Lord came to me. Zerubbabel started rebuilding the temple and he will complete it. That will be your confirmation that the God of angel armies sent me to you. God becomes this man's cheerleader and he starts smack talking the pile of rubble. Why? Because the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. God is delighting in Zerubbabel's way. God has ordered his steps and he is holding him up with his hand. By the way, did you know that psychologists have discovered something fascinating about our human nature? They discovered this. Most people will never quit. They just never get started. Did you know that? If we're serious about wanting to get busy with the life that we believe that God wants us to have, we gotta get to stepping. So often people, when they get stuff, I get asked, PC, do you think I just need to take a leap of faith? And my answer is no, because a leap of faith is not biblical. Really? The Bible says the steps of a good man ordered by the Lord. If you study your Bible, the only person that's ever been telling somebody to take a leap of faith was the devil trying to tell Jesus to jump off the temple. God leads us in steps. Too often we think that God's telling us to do something that's so huge, and it really isn't. We just need to be proactive in our lives and get to work. We need to stop thinking like religious people and start thinking like kingdom people. Yeah. What do you mean, PC? What's the difference? Let me explain that. Religious people only look for miracles. They want God to take care of them without any effort on their part. They want magic supply with immediate results and it doesn't work that way. Kingdom people, however, have a growth mentality. They say, I need to get to work. I am gonna do something because God works as I work. God can't even steer a parked car. Are y'all following me? The steps of a good man or woman are ordered by God, not the leaps. So maybe you're here today and you're discouraged because things aren't going as fast as you want it to. May I bring some good news to you this morning? <laughs> Slow growth is still growth. Hey, are, are we moving the ball forward? God is not gonna leave you with here in this pile of issues. What God has started in your life, he will complete in Jesus' name. He's gonna send to us the right people. He's gonna put his word in us and give us the strength we need when we need it. Paul knew this kind of strength and he echoed this in scripture when he wrote to the church at Philippi when he was in jail. He said this, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. What God starts, he finishes. So take the next step. Look at your name and say, get to stepping. And look how God starts bragging on his boy Zerubbabel again. 
Verse 10 says this, does anyone despise this day of small beginnings? They'll change their tune when they see Zerubbabel setting the last stone in place. <laughs> God's telling him, buddy, it's gonna look like ain't nothing getting done to some people, but it's mind over matter. What does that mean? Whenever I was a, I've been the offensive line coach, I've been the strength coach, and whenever times, by the way, it's so darn hot. Lord God, I remember telling the, those guys whenever it gets so hot, and I was tell, talking to them like I was talking to myself. I said, like, guys, it's mind over matter. If you don't mind, it don't matter. And here's the thing. It's a day of small beginnings. Small beginnings. What kind of beginnings? Small beginnings. Satan wants us to hate the day of small beginnings because he knows that once we get started, we won't quit. So he does his best to keep us from even getting started. Satan fears what God does in our life in small beginnings and taking small steps with God. And he hates it even more what God brings out of small beginnings. By the way, the temple got built by Zerubbabel and at first people would see it and they'd cry because it wasn't as big and grand as Solomon's temple. Oh, oh man, we just, we just got a little regular old temple. And by the way, they cried because they hated small beginnings. God even had to send a prophet named Haggai to tell the people that despise the day of small beginnings, hey, chill out. The glory of this temple is gonna be greater than the glory of the first one. It took 50 years to rebuild that temple and by the time it was done, it was the grandest building in all the world. That temple, watch this, was 500 yards long and 400 yards wide. It was so beautiful, the temple was covered on the outside with brilliantly shined gold plates and when the sun hit it, it, it was blinding. And by the way, and when there wasn't gold on the building, there was marble that was so white that people, uh, when strangers would come uh, walking into town, they'd be like, oh my God, there's snow on top of the temple. No, it's just how brilliant the marble was. There wasn't even a building in Rome that looked like it. It was finished just in time for Jesus to be born and dedicated in it. He came back to the temple at age 12 and asked the doctors and the teachers uh, questions and he answered the questions that he was asking them. Jesus would teach there. He'd drive out the money changers there. And Zechariah told all of them who hated small beginnings, guys, this may not look like much, but trust me, the future is great because of what's gonna happen here. Because with God, the biggest things always start small. Just a, just a mustard seed, just take a step. So what's, what's your next step, Highlands Church? Is it to give your life to Jesus? Is it to follow him in water baptism? Maybe this week, start coming to the prayer meeting and start reading your Bible every day. Maybe it's time to get in a small group. Maybe it's time to lead a small group. Maybe it's the time to take a step and begin to honor God with your money and pay him the first 10%. Is it time to maybe get some marriage counseling? Whatever that step is that God's asking us to do, it's a step that we can do. If our musicians would come and play really quick, I wanna encourage you, be faithful in this step and God will give you the next one. Make the appointment, write the check, Sign up to lead the class, attend Celebrate Recovery, get some prayer and help with your hurts and your hangups because God wants to change your story this year and give us more than enough to bless our lives and leave a legacy for our family and our kids. Here's what I wanna let you know something before I leave today. I wanna make sure that you know my life has been built on small steps. When I came to Jesus, I was a hopeless, helpless alcoholic. Alcoholism runs into my family. We're Staffords. We drink. That's just what we do. One of the oldest pubs in the world is in Dublin, Ireland. Guess what the name of it is? Stafford's Pub. Guys, I have 500 plus years of alcohol strongholds. If you go to a family reunion, you'll see all my uncles. They got shiny heads and they got really red faces because that's what we do. I remember some, my wife and I were talking the other day. She was like, Chad, why did, why did you drink and take all those pills and stuff like that? Did you, just, did you just wanna feel good? And I said, sweetheart, you don't understand with an addict, we don't drink because we wanna feel good. We drink and we take pills and we do drugs because we don't wanna feel anything. I 
I'd tried, I'd tried to kill myself twice. By the way, there's nothing more that makes you feel like a loser than trying to kill yourself and being unsuccessful with that. <laughs> like, oh my God, I'm such a loser, I can't even kill myself. I'd tried to get sober on my own. I went to court-ordered rehab, okay? I couldn't do it. I was raised in the church. I knew all the rules. I just couldn't keep them. My sisters always loved and served God. I look at guys like Hal who loved Jesus and served Jesus, and I just didn't understand why I couldn't do it. And on June the 9th of 1993, my best friend lied to me to get, to get, get me to go to church. I was already dating a girl and he told me that a prettier girl was interested in me. And she was coming to church that night. So I, I was like, hey, look, I don't mind an upgrade. You know, so I, I was unsaved. Come on, give me a little bit of break. I went to church seeking galvation, not salvation. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. And I walked in that room, although I was raised in church, I walked in that youth room that night and I walked in and I looked at my best friend. I said, something's gonna go down tonight. There were kids up in there praying in the Holy Ghost. I ain't know nothing about that. I walked up in there during worship time. I'm like, man, I don't, this is, I never felt anything like this. There was a Cajun preacher got up and preached. <laughs> and I still remember his accent to this day. And he told everybody, head bowed, eye closed. I didn't know nothing. I, I've been in church. I knew what the drill was. As soon as he said that, I started walking to the aisle. Come on, some of y'all don't know what it's like to get saved now. Y'all just raise y'all's hand. Y'all get, get the chicken way out. In my place, you wasn't saved until you came down and cried in front of everybody. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. I start making my way down there, and here was my salvation prayer was, Lord, I want to be a Christian. I just don't know how. You know what the Holy Spirit told me? Right then and there, why don't you just take it day by day? cried my eyes out and I said, Lord, you know me. I ain't gonna come down here and make any promises to you because I can't. I just tell you that I ain't gonna get drunk tonight. Now tomorrow that may be a whole other breed of dog. But if you'll help me, I, they told me I need to start reading my Bible every day. I'll start doing it in the morning. An encounter with Jesus did something for me that my mama's tears couldn't do, my daddy's preaching couldn't do, and what rehab could not do. Jesus Christ set me free. I have been sober for almost 32 years. Ain't touched the drop. How? One step at a time. Small steps. How do you eat elephant, PC? One bite at a time. I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know if it's something at a job. I don't know if it's something in your marriage. I don't know if it's something with an addiction. I don't know. All I do know is that if you get to stepping, you take one step toward God. You take one step toward him, I promise you, he'll help you do the rest. You take it one day at a time, one mountain at a time, and he will create a life for you you never imagined. I had no idea God was gonna call me into ministry. You know what my goals were at age 19? to stay stoned and follow the grateful dead. God can change your future, ladies and gentlemen. He can change the future of your children. He can change anything that we take a step toward, anything that you wanna see, plant a seed for and watch what God does. Can we pray? Father, I love you so much. I thank you again for another opportunity I've had to share your word with people I just love and respect so much. Thank you for the blessing that is this church. But thank you for what they're about to do. Thank you for what they're embarking on. May they not despise the day of small beginnings. Lord, for the glory on this house is gonna be greater than it used to be because of you leading us one step at a time, fixing us one issue at a time, and helping us to trust you day by day. Thank you for the truth of your word that sets us free and keeps us free. In Jesus' name, with every head still bowed, every eye still closed, if you're here today, you say, Pastor Chad, I don't have a relationship with God. Or maybe you one time served God, but you've drifted and fallen away. And all throughout this service, maybe you felt there was this pulling on you. Let me tell you what that pulling is. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the God that created you that wants to have a relationship with you. And you can begin one right here and right now. So if you're here right now with nobody looking around, 
Say, Pastor Chad, I'm not right with God today. Hey, I'm not going to call you forward. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pray, lead you into prayer, and you're going to be assured for heaven as if you were already there. Tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, you are going to know that you are right with God. So if that's you, with it, and nobody look around, you say, PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Would you just lift up your hand real quick? PC, pray for me. I'm not right with God. Is there anybody I can pray? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Those of us watching online, everybody in this room, we're all going to pray this prayer together and you're going to be assured for heaven as if you were already there. Pray this prayer out loud with me, Highland Church. Dear Lord Jesus, you know I'm a sinner and I know I'm a sinner and I've committed sins. But today, Lord Jesus, I give you those sins. I ask you to come into my heart, wash me clean, and I'll live for you as you show me how. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's give it up for all those that gave their life to Jesus Come today. On. Come on. People made decisions for Jesus. Let's give it up today. Hallelujah.